Okay, welcome everybody. We are um we're gonna make a start, I think. It's one o'clock UK time. Very warm welcome to today's IIED debates event, which is all about the decarbonization debate. And we're gonna be um exploring climate action for equitable cities. Today's event is part of London Climate Action Week. Um, lots of events happening across the week and we're really, really delighted and excited that you took uh, time today to, to join us and come and um, explore this really important uh, topic. We've got 60 minutes together uh, today. I'm sure that's going to fly by super quickly. So I'm just going to jump straight in and um, run through a couple of housekeeping points. Um, just to let you know, today's event is being recorded and it will be publicly available afterwards. You um, or all of those who registered for the event via Eventbrite in advance will get a, a recording sent directly to your inbox. Um, within a week or so. We've also got the live transcript tool enabled, which is a, a subtitle tool. It's all automatically generated by Zoom, so it's not 100% perfect. Um, and we've selected um, the interpretation is in English for today. Um, you can hide, show, or um, adjust those, those um, subtitle settings as you prefer. Um, while we're settling in, I would invite you to open up the chat panel, introduce yourself, um, learn who else is in the room, uh, please do say your name, where you are in the world, the organisation that you're with, if you're happy to share that, um, and we'll just help others to get a feel for, for who's in the audience today. And really would encourage you to share resources, share links, um, share materials that are relevant for this discussion, and hopefully we can all take away as much as possible. You might have a drop down, um, when you send a chat, so it might say everyone or it might say hosts and panelists, please select everyone so that everybody in the room can can see that. Um, we are very much hoping that you've got questions for our speakers. Um, you might already have one in mind or it might emerge through the discussion and we would invite you to put those specifically in our Q&A uh, function. So that's along the bottom of your Zoom window and that will help us to sort of track those, monitor those um, and also prioritise those hopefully so when we come to the 15 minutes or so of Q&A we can um, get through as many of your amazing questions as possible. You're also invited to upvote so if there's a question that you like there or it's similar to something you had in mind then you can hit the thumbs up button and it'll move up the, um, up the question um, order. Um, that's it from me so without further ado very delighted to hand over to Tucker Landsman at the now um, and he's a senior researcher in IID's Human Settlements Research Group. Tucker over to you please. Thanks very much Julia. Um, welcome everybody good afternoon or morning or evening depending on where you are joining us from as Juliet mentioned my name is Tucker Landisman I'm a senior researcher at IIED and focused on climate action for more equitable cities. Um, and together with my colleague Animal Nikki, I co-edited the most recent issue of Environment and an Urbanization on uh, connecting decarbonization and social justice in cities. Now, some of you might hear that topic and think it's a no-brainer, there's, there's no debate. Um, whereas others actually might have an immediate urge to ask a series of critical questions or unpack the proposition uh, itself. And the, to the topic we, we should recognize starts with an assumption that all cities should decarbonize, including cities in low and middle income countries. Now we're open to having, we're open to having that, that assumption questioned. And indeed in the past years we've worked on this topic, We've noticed various kind of decarbonization divides, if you will. We've heard resistance or hesitation from grassroots activists, from partner NGOs, and even from our own colleagues within IIED. There are concerns about distracting from a priority agenda of adaptation and resilience. There's criticisms that driving decarbonization in the global south is a donor-driven agenda from wealthy countries in the north. And at times, there's genuine confusion at the suggestion that mitigating greenhouse gas emissions should be a priority uh, agenda point when discussing the 1.1 billion people currently living in informal and vulnerable settlements without adequate housing or access to reliable basic services. These are all valid concerns, and there's even more than what I just mentioned. However, what remains true is that the highest urbanization rates are in the global south 
And the fastest growing cities are actually small and medium sized cities in the global south. And local and national governments are struggling to address the challenges that these kind of rapid rate of urban growth um, present, as well as take advantage of the opportunities that the growth presents. It's a fact that we actually have the technology and know how to retrofit and to build a new kind of low and zero carbon cities, but aligning that technology capacity and importantly money in the places that need it is no easy task. So according to analysis from Climate Pol Policy Institute, which tracks climate finance, the vast majority of climate finance for cities occurs in OECD countries plus China, and less than 10% of what they're able to track at the project level is focused on adaptation. That means over 90% of climate finance is mitigation focused. Now this data is pre-pandemic, CPI is gonna come out with new numbers this year. That might change a little bit, but let's assume that it's still more or less true. And what does that mean? So for us, it means we need to ground the mitigation agenda in the reality of Southern urbanism and make sure it speaks to the real priorities of climate resilient development. And it means we need to decarbonize and address energy poverty. We need to decarbonize while dramatically shrinking housing deficits that have skyrocketed under current rates of urbanization and the financialized commodification of housing. It means we need to decarbonize and recognize that informal workers and low-income households are already spending significant amounts of their time and resources and money to mitigate climate risk that they face and to rebuild often, repeatedly, after climate stresses and disasters. So today we're not offering kind of a classic two-side debate of the issue, but we do hope to unpack that proposition from diverse viewpoints and geographies. And we really, as Juliet said, encourage you to use the chat, drop your own links, your own thoughts, provocations. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to ask the panel a question, please use the Q&A, not the chat, and we'll be monitoring that. Um, so with this, uh, welcome again, and I will hand over to Anna. Thanks, Tucker. And hi, everyone. I'm Anna Wolnicki. I'm a principal researcher here at IID. Um, and as Tucker mentioned, I co-edited the, the special issue that we're about to discuss today. Um, so, yeah, the papers in this issue, they contribute to debates around climate justice and they point to the opportunities that we have to connect decarbonisation to social justice in cities in the majority world. And as Tucker mentioned, we do really recognise that adaptation is the Im immediate priority um, and often the starting point for vulnerable urban communities that live on the front line of climate change. However, the papers, are in, papers in this special issue are here to sort of explore and demonstrate how decarbonisation as a process of mitigation should be an essential component for our efforts to achieve urban climate justice and climate resilient development in cities. Um, so if in, I, I'd point you to our, to our editorial that kind of goes into these three themes in a bit more detail. But the papers broadly um, support three relevant lines of research and debate that respond to this gap. Um, the first theme considers how and why vulnerable communities are legitimate sites, not only for adaptation, but also for mitigation. And it looks at the role that low-income low communities can play in, in those associated planning processes. So Nura Ali, who's here today, um, along with her colleagues, they wrote a paper that explores how the knowledge and practice of low-income communities in Lagos, Nairobi and Johannesburg, um, who are all engaged in local infrastructural development, are able to challenge global sustainability narratives and in turn contribute to a reframing of urban climate justice that's predicated on access to resources and broader patterns of participation. Um, secondly, we've got a paper that uses data collected by WeGo um, and Sonia Diaz, who's here today, along with her colleagues, um, have presented research on waste research on waste pickers' engagement with climate action, um, including emissions reduction. In this paper, they argue that research on their specific needs including the discrimination and poverty that they've experienced can reveal how Wastebook has have a much more nuanced understanding of the local impacts of climate change and this has significant implications for resilience and social justice. 
There's a second theme that explores the extent to which low carbon infrastructural initiatives can align with efforts to respond to structural poverty and inequality in cities. And I draw your attention to a paper by um, Lauren Hermanus and Liza Cirolia, which considers the implications of efforts to improve access to decentralised urban renewal en energy projects in Uganda. Particularly, this speaks to how Despite efforts to decentralise and distribute technologies, renewable energy governance is often fragmented and contested and can be dominated by international donors, leaving little room for participation of local government and local communities. Um, finally, there's a theme that speaks to or that reflects on the normative urban climate justice framings that exist um, and what opportunities there are for current climate policy and action arenas um, to include better participation of urban stakeholders, including local government and vulnerable urban communities. Um, so Michael and Hoho -Ho are here today, will reflect specifically on the work of um, five urban labs that have been established um, through the Transformative Urban Coalitions Programme, which is funded by IKI. Um, specifically, specifically, Ho Ho will provide reflections on one urban lab that has been established in uh, Buenos Aires that incorporates efforts to decarbonise into an existing participatory slum upgrading scheme. I'd also draw your attention to a paper by Herrera on the impact of municipal green bonds in San Francisco, Mexico City and Cape Town. Um, so using the established framework of procedural recognition and distributional justice, uh, the paper sets out how subnational green debts can produce climate injustices in cities. And I'd also flag Alba's paper that outlines how municipal actors are still struggling to integrate gender equality into their climate policies and plans. So there's a wealth of papers there for you to have a look at. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to um, I'm going to get the conversation going. So we've got just over half an hour for discussion and then about 15 minutes for your questions. Uh, we've got four broad questions, some of which are more relevant to certain papers than others. Um, and yeah, I'm going to just open up the conversation. My my first question actually is specifically for you, you Nura. Um, I wonder if you could reflect a bit on your paper and tell us a bit about how and why low income and informal communities are actually legitimate sites, not only for adaptation or integrated climate action, but also for decarbonisation. Thank you very much, uh, Anna and Tucker and Juliet. Um, and thank everybody for, for coming. Um, so the first question about why low income uh, communities or neighbourhoods are sort of uh, legitimate sites for decarbonization is not so much from sort of the global north perspective of um, countries need to decarbonize because of climate change but I want to have sort of a different perspective that goes more into social justice and just sort of practical values of uh, de uh, settlements which do not take um, sort of middle and higher income uh, residents out of their uh, responsibility to proportionately, obviously, um, address this with, with more resources. Most from my experience in Nigeria and in Lagos um, specifically, but also drawing on um, learnings from, uh, from other authors from our paper. And so what we can see in uh, low income uh, neighborhoods is that a lot of public infrastructure that is needed to address uh, basic needs is not really there. So people come up with their own solutions. They build their own infrastructures, um, such as water production sites or uh, transport systems or uh, even health systems. And so because there is no real sort of um, power network or power grid um, that can supply uh, electricity uh, continuously and, and um, sort of reliably, people power these infrastructures with diesels. Everybody has their own way, sort of uh, rely on, um, on, on having access to oil and gas. Um, and they're very much at the mercy of uh, global oil and gas sites that um, directly reflect the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, oil and gas and, and diesel in their sort of um, in their uh, distribution and, and supply within low income settlements. And so because people do not really have any say in um, sustainability 
uh, strategies and, and discourses, um, they're more or less at the mercy of this. So if you give people an alternative to become more independent, I think it wouldn't it wouldn't be seen as sort of an imposing of strategies, but rather sort of listening and seeing uh, what kinds of structures are already in place. And so that is one thing. And then the other thing is also on sort of more uh, public infrastructure, because sometimes you do have public infrastructures um, such as hospitals or primary health care centers that are there in uh, in low income communities but again because of power cuts or, or unreliable uh, electricity sources they need uh, mega generators to uh, be able to care for their for their patients and so for example one um, one project proposal of a an urban planning agency that wants to build more sustainable infrastructure, specifically in low income uh, communities in Lagos, was coming up with the idea to, for example, power one ward um, that needs a lot of electricity just with solar panels um, to basically make the hospital more independent from these fluctuations. So yes, it definitely also tackles climate justice or, or independent of, of these fluctuations fluctuations and plan better um, where to invest their money and spend more money in education, for example. Um, but uh, you also sort of work with, with the local structures that are there um, and, uh, yeah, don't try to centralise the whole the whole system. Thanks, Noura. Um, I was wondering if we could, I'd, I'd really like to get into um, the the sort of the nuance of specific examples of low carbon initiatives that can align with efforts to respond to poverty and inequality in cities um and so in order to do that i'd, I'd quite like to turn to michael and ho ho to hear a bit more about um some of the examples that came out of your paper maybe specifically from buenos aires um michael shall i start with you does that make sense could you tell me a bit more about the, some of the initiatives that have come out of the urban labs that you've been documenting general findings and then Hoho can perhaps uh, add some of the details, especially from Buenos Aires. So um, examples of how low carbon initiatives can be aligned with efforts to address structural and spatial urban inequalities. It's first of all imperative to link low carbon activities with these kinds of activities that help to resolve um, everyday priorities and everyday problems of people in local neighborhoods or settlements. So these dual or multiple use um, activities or initiatives, because um, in the five cities and urban labs that we've worked in, in Argentina, Mexico and Brazil, um, in many of these uh, lower income neighborhoods, of course, climate change and even climate adaptations weren't the first priorities of uh, that people have in their everyday lives. So um, they're open to to, of course, addressing climate issues and climate change. Uh, but often it makes a lot of sense to link these two problems that they have anyway, like bad air that they have to breathe or a lot of transport or safety issues or so. So finding these kinds of solutions that really effectively link these issues where people see a benefit in their everyday life, but that beyond that also make a contribution to climate change or climate adaptation really is as necessary. And finding these kinds of initiatives or activities is not something that can be done from the outside because it really depends a lot on the local context. So it's basically yeah, necessary to uh, get people involved, people who live there, to prioritize problems, prioritize, prioritize issues, and then um, develop approaches uh, together with them. And that's something that we have done in uh, urban labs. And there are different kinds of urban labs, but the kind of urban labs that we have set up in these five cities or established together with local partners are basically um, spaces or is an approach where local representatives of uh, local governments, of civil society organizations, researchers, private sector, and so on come together regularly every two, three, four weeks or so, and then discuss what a vision could be for the respective neighborhood uh, that would be more climate friendly, more climate adapted, uh, and that also addresses local problems. And depending on the local context, it was often necessary, first of all, to uh, deal with the distrust between actors, because sometimes civil society activists and uh, local government representatives, for example, don't really work that closely with each other. So to build that trust between them and show that both of them can learn and gain from each other's insights, 
was necessary and that often worked in, in all of the five cities and then to dig into how to deal with climate challenges how to deal with urban uh, with everyday challenges in the urban uh, in the urban context and that's what we've done through these urban labs for about three years now um and i think from there i'll uh, hand over to hoho perhaps to provide some insights on the case of uh, buenos aires um, yes, thanks, Michael. Um, adding to what Michael just mentioned, it, um, we worked specifically in a low-income neighborhood in the city of Buenos Aires, Pisa 20, with, with the advantage that uh, the, this informal settlement was already uh, in the process of uh, an, an urban upgrading uh, scheme. So it was very participatory. They were working in solving the typical needs of, of low-income neighborhoods in terms of accessing to different services, infrastructure, housing. So that was being sort of taken care of and it was organized together with the community and the government. But they were not really thinking about climate change or the impacts of climate change or how, what they could be doing differently to incorporate uh, this dimension in, in the planning process. So with the urban lab, what we started doing in, in, in this case was bringing in this di dimension. But as Michael mentioned, it's very difficult to, to, to link uh, the tension between addressing present needs with other needs that are seen as more global or further in the future. So our first effort was really to, to um, sort of convince uh, all stakeholders, that's included professionals and technical teams from the government and the community members, that we that these were not um, things that were um, sort of, um, oh, sorry, my words in English, uh, um, they were not competing for resources in terms of man, uh, financial resources, human resources, but they could be done simultane simultaneously. So I think the the, one of the greatest uh, positive aspects of the project we were developing is that we could implement together, co-create solutions that were speaking to the needs of the neighborhood, but we're also incorporating these different dimensions. And, and in particular, like just, they were small examples, but for example, um, adding uh, shaded, uh, shaded areas, uh, pergolas, green spaces, uh, 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 retrofitting with permeable uh, uh, soil covers. So adding different things that, were, that had not been thought of before in the reurbanization planning process. So once they were seeing that this could be done and, the, and this was being co-designed by everyone working in the urban lab, the, it was a, a very quick uh, sort of um, win in in that sense, and and everyone, both government teams and the community, realized that it was very easy to think about the things before, and it was complementary to the whole reurbanization process, uh, and this could be something that they could share with other neighbors and in other neighborhood neighborhoods. So I think the possibility to 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 implement a project to show how it could be done and how it was, this was solving some of the problems they were having was a very, had a very positive impact and, and like sort of really it took the, the project to another level that if we hadn't had that possibility, it was very difficult to visualize this, uh, this narrative. It was like, we don't, we don't, we don't need a tree. We don't need, uh, in, in, uh, open spaces to help to contribute with air circulation and uh, we just need more building, more square meters because we need a home, we need water, we need uh, uh, sanitation, which are very basic needs and of course a priority. But we were showing ways that they could be talking about everything together, not just as different uh, things. That's really useful. And, and I guess just to sort of probe a bit deeper on that and it does lead quite neatly to our third question which I think Sonia would also be interested in answering but from those kind of specific local interventions what opportunities are there do you think in the kind of current climate 
pol policy and action arenas for the participation of stoke stakeholders, including low income communities and informal and people living in informal settlements to participate? Have you identified clear spaces or opportunities to scale or even to replicate some of those processes, perhaps in other cities? Um, and I, I think that question is to, well, it's to, to Michael and Hoho to begin with, but then I'll also, I'll also bring Sonia in. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump right in. Uh, okay. Thanks to IUZ uh, for the invitation and every, everybody, you know, for coming. Uh, well, I think one of uh, uh, the important opportunities is actually to visualize the uh, issue around climate uh, change and waste speakers, uh, an issue that has been a bit invisible. And I think one important thing was the fact that the IPCC has highlighted the impacts of climate change and how they are compounded by the ongoing challenges that already exist in cities. This is important. It's something that activists and some engaged scholars have also been highlighting, you know, highlighting the importance of considering the concerns of the most vulnerable in planning uh, for climate change. And in the last year, uh, the debate on, on, on just transition, which has also caught on, uh, has been an opportunity that it's throwing um, light on how inequality and marginalization uh, compound climate change impacts and actually uh, exacerbate the vulnerability to climate change. And, it's important, uh, however, to acknowledge that there is a need for more coordinated efforts to recognize that uh, vulnerable groups are, are already playing important roles in advancing sustainability uh, and that they deserve to be granted special attention in terms of meeting uh, their needs in adaptation so that we can improve their contribution. The contribution that they are already giving to mitigation of GHG, and this is precisely the case for waste speakers, an occupation that is often associated with uh, high levels of poverty and livelihood insecurity, uh, often, uh, you know, an occupation that poses direct health risks to, to those involved and at the same time at the same time is an essential uh, uh kind of occupation and uh, they it's an occupation where you know uh workers are playing in a very key environmental uh work and their contribution is often ignored by by cities and we know that waste management is Play, it plays a crucial role in reducing the vulnerability to climate change uh, because we know that poorly managed waste, you know, compounds climate change risks such as uh, flash floodings. So there is there an opportunity in terms of um, uh, of shifting the narrative against informal workers and show how waste speakers are essential in the fight of uh, climate change in cities. Uh, there is this urgent need to incorporate uh, in the current climate policies the issue for waste speakers by recognizing their roles, their rights, and understanding that the knowledge and experience something that my you know that my colleagues uh previously already highlighted uh, you know the importance of the uh experience of those affected to be part of the solutions but what we uh we uh found out you know in doing our uh, our uh, literature review when we started our research that was uh, uh, published in this special issue was how invisible the issue of waste speakers is. And, and this is what led us, you know, to Wigo to partner with the University of uh, Sheffield. And we conducted this exploratory survey with waste speakers in my country, Brazil. It was a, a nationwide uh, uh, research. And we, in our research, we identified how waste speakers uh, 
are already experienced, as everybody else, you know, climate change impacts, they are uh, developing their coping strategies, but still they don't have the support of uh, policymakers in terms of enhance their uh, policy, uh, their coping strategies to uh, really improve it to be uh, more transformative adaptation strategies. And our uh, survey specifically showed how we speakers uh, are uh, themselves finding uh, what is needed in terms of building their resilience and issues around uh, uh, resources for uh, climate change sensitive infrastructure, working to structure was some of the things that came up high in our research and also the importance of having them, you know, uh, at the planning of adaptation. So inclusive climate governance was something that came up high. I, I won't speak about that uh, uh, right away and now I'll speak about that later because this is one of the issue, issues, inclusive climate governance with a seat at the table for way speakers in planning and implementing adaptation. Thanks so much, Sonia. Um, Michael and Hoho, does any of that, um, it'd be useful to kind of just sort of loop back a little bit to some of the examples that you were talking about and, and to, 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 to see if you've got any reflections on how some of that learning could be useful or, or how some of those processes could be integrated into policy spaces or even taken up by other cities. Um, and anything that you'd like to just to put on the table. All of that resonates, and maybe just two points on that. Um, the first point is uh, very much at the local or regional, sometimes even national level, and that is that I think if given the opportunity or people begin to realize that these kinds of transformations and climate changes in cities cannot be done against people, but only with the people. And that's not happening across the board, of course, but there seems to be an openness of policymakers to that, that they realize this and that there are approaches to have this kind of inclusive um, urban governance uh, in terms of climate transformation. So, for example, in the, the labs that we've worked in, of course, the contexts differ very much. But what we've seen is that the local government representatives, on the one hand, after having been in the urban labs for a couple of weeks or months, they began to realize that uh, civil society representatives, for example, could make contributions to their planning process, to their governance process, that before meeting them in urban labs, they didn't even know about. And so that this this micro level trust was was beginning to build up there in these uh, conversations, and the same way the other way around, the so civil society or neighborhood association members, especially disadvantaged or women uh, female members, sometimes uh, really got empowered through this process because they began sitting there just listening, not really feeling very open to to talking about something because they felt they didn't have the vocabulary they needed or the knowledge or expertise they needed. But after having worked with uh, experts and local government representatives, they build up their trust and they begin to intervene and bring up uh, insights from their everyday um, lives and, and challenges that they had. And so uh, in Teresina, I've just read a report about uh, our urban lab in Teresina now, where we've looked at the past three years from an ethnographic perspective. And there we've seen that a whole group of women members who in the beginning were very shy to contribute and didn't really feel very comfortable contributing to the discussion. They are now basically running the lab and many of the local initiatives and activities. So I think that there is this potential at the local and at the urban and at the national level for people to be empowered and also for local government and in general government representatives to open up to these inputs. Um, and at the, the broader, the national or even international level, there's also some openness. So just one example from our project, um, the Brazilian federal government, uh, they refounded the Ministry of Urban Affairs and they have a program called Premio uh, Periferia Viva now where they basically establish urban labs in, I'm not sure about the exact number, 60 something cities across the country um, with a lot of money. And it's not exactly the same approach that we are using. 
but we have written guidelines for them. Uh, and they're using some kind of urban lab model, so participatory and inclusive uh, urban governance. Um, and so they, we we see that this this approach uh, can be scaled. It's it's possible, and some of the governments begin to realize that. And I think that's uh, yeah, that's a very hopeful uh, picture. Not sure, Koho, if you want to add something. Uh, perhaps a bit shortly on what's going on in 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 Buenos Aires. Um, I, I think this the, this idea of implementing pilot projects and urban labs helped change the narrative, and that sort of had the different uh, spin-offs. Uh, you say in English, it was it had a snowball effect somehow, and so the different groups started, as M Michael mentioned, uh, doing different things. Uh, on the one side, uh, the Institute of Housing of the City of Buenos Aires, that was sort of the in charge of the reurbanization process, they started incorporating many of the solutions we were testing in their future project uh, projects. Uh, the community in itself, once they started feeling, as Michael mentioned too, more comfortable with the concepts, the ideas, they started uh, pushing to incorporate within their their everyday practice uh, um, the 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 issues we were discussing, they started even um, setting, in some cases, setting up uh, community initiatives that had to do with, for example, uh, building uh, blocks with recycled, uh, construction blocks with the recycled plastics. They, together with other government areas that, that deal more with climate change and, and data generation of the city, uh, they, there's a we implemented a, a temperature and humidity monitoring system that's generating data on how temperature and humidity impacts uh, Barrio 20, Villa 20, and how this has to do with um, how this could be compared with other parts of the city and, and, and how the, the importance of adding green and shade and, and somehow better bioclimatic comfort in, in, in the house, in the homes of the people. And we hope that that will uh, act as a, be um, resources that could be taken up by the next uh, climate action plan of the city, which before really didn't look that much at low-income neighborhoods. So this is really important data that has been generating with the community about this. Um, and we also seen that there is not perhaps at government level, because we know that governments change and, and they have different ideas. And sometimes it's difficult to keep, uh, in, at least in our countries, interested in, and motivation in, in, in some issues. But we know that other cities are really interested in, in Argentina to, to learn about what's being done with this within these urban uh, labs and and the me methodology used and the different solutions tested and there's a very uh, a very big interest in, in in learning from each other and even within community groups something that we know that happens a lot in different parts of of the world but sometimes it's difficult to to make it happen actually um, Thanks, Ho Ho. Um, and so I'm just going to move on to our, our last question. Uh, it's actually a question that I've stolen directly from Nura's paper. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I wondered if I'm inviting Nura and Sonia to reflect on the extent to which the world's urban majority and, and what I'm talking about in that context is people that live in vulnerable and low income urban communities can reframe sustainability agendas. So that's climate action, but also broader sustainability agendas that, that, that tend to also guide our development practice. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hand to you, Nura, first, and then on to Sonia afterwards. Thank you. Um, so I think my answer really feeds back into what has been said um, by the, the previous um, uh, panelists. And so I want to structure it into two sort of uh, areas. One is the 
um, area of sort of uh, epistemic injustices and knowledge systems, and the other one is sort of from a practical policy uh, perspective of uh, climate funding and climate funding bodies and how they sort of fail to reach those who are at the forefront of uh, sustainability practices and uh, and uh, climate change mitigation uh, adaptation and and decarbonization so we know that most uh, sort of uh, climate strategies are formulated um, or, or come from countries that are historically more responsible for climate change um, and that um, sort of people who are affected mostly in uh, cities like for example Lagos Nairobi um, Johannesburg uh, Jakarta, you name them, um, they are not really in these spaces to formulate uh, sustainability agendas. And so we see a problem here um, where we can say that the knowledge systems that we have in place, they don't really favor these voices to be reflected in um, academic uh, um, So uh, we know that sort of the knowledge systems that are in place are tilted in favor of um, uh, sort of the countries that are uh, more responsible for climate change and so the problem is how to reframe um, uh, sustainability agendas by having more epistemic equality um, and and that can happen through recognizing existing infrastructures um, but also by looking at how these infrastructures work and how um, and I think that's what uh, what uh, Michael was saying for how you can work with um, what is already in place uh, rather than coming up with sustainability agendas that do not really reflect the local realities because we don't have knowledge about the, the local realities. And so um, embedding sort of sustainability offices more on a local level um, is one very practical um, thing that, that we can do instead of just having them at a national or municipal level um, where you, you have a sort of disjuncture between uh, local practices and sustainability NGOs or, or uh, private actors that sort of um, try to push this forward and national policies and municipal policies. So um, linking these two more together could really um, contribute to painting a more realistic way of um, pathways to, to sustainability. And then the other thing that I want to talk about is sort of the policy level and, and funding body level. And, and there's a real lack of capacity from funding bodies to reach these actors that are already in place and they need green finance, they need sort of uh, climate funding. But the problem is that the language spoken um, by uh, global, international, but also national funding bodies is not really translated to um, sort of these organizational structures um, in terms of how proposals work, how the whole funding cycle works, but also in terms of um, how organizations need to be structured and equipped to be um, um, to, to, to qualify. Um, for these uh, sort of uh, funding mechanisms in the first place. So I think here it would be really uh, good to sort of talk about and see how you can integrate these systems and to see how you can sort of support uh, the, the proposal state already by sort of supporting organizations and uh, and local actors in uh, writing proposals and translating their knowledge into the language that can then be sort of um, accepted by uh, by these global uh, green funding bodies. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that's uh, basically how I think we can really tap into these systems. Thank you. Thanks, Nura. Sonia, do you want, can I give you the final words on this question for the panel at least yeah. before we turn to the audience? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, complementing uh, Nura to the important point she made, my uh, contribution is towards highlighting the importance uh, that engage uh, scholars and activists uh, in terms of doing a concerted work towards inclusive climate governance. We, we know how urban climate governance is dominated by top-down knowledge, which is inadequate to address the needs of the urban uh, informal workers and informal communities. Uh, we know that um, uh, national adaptation uh, committees even fail to include uh, local government authorities, uh, which usually are tasked uh, 
to implement climate policies. We know that climate climate policy primarily sits at the national level, but with a heavy reliance on the local authorities, you know, for uh, for the bulk of implementation. So there is, you know, this uh, urgent need uh, to focus on locally led adaptation plans. And also there is a huge uh, gap on how to do it, you know, locally led adaptation in ways that are inclusive to all. And so, and, and also how to deal with uh, the, the opaque nature of, of uh, implementation of this adaptation um, uh, plan. So we, we need to work towards inclusive governance and to factor the voices of low-income communities, to factor the voices of workers in the formal uh, economy. We have been working towards that uh, in, uh, in the work that we do at WeGo, particularly in the work uh, in Brazil, where I live. Uh, one such example is our participation uh, at, the, uh, at Belo Horizonte, the city uh, where I live, uh, in, in, in the adaptation committee. We have a way speaker and WeGo is also sitting at this adaptation committee and we are working uh, together with the city to factor in climate vulnerability, the production of climate vulnerability maps, the in integration in the city's inventory uh, about the contribution that way speakers give to mitigating uh, uh, climate change. And you know, we need to do it in ways that are integrated. It's not only at the local level, but also working at the national level. So in this sense, we are trying our work at WIGU to uh, in, uh, work with different levels of government. We are participating in Brazil's Forum for Climate Change, which is uh, it's a civil society uh, uh, forum, which is helping the government with the drafting of the Plano Clima, the Cl Brazil's climate plan. So we are there trying to uh, make alliances with key actors in civil society and with governments of all levels to plan effective for climate uh, uh, change in ways that workers are integrated. Uh, also, there is, you know, to, to conclude, there is also a work that workers' organizations themselves need to do. We do need to frame climate change in more comprehensive ways. And Workers' organizations, they can and they should seek support uh, to partners, donors, and uh, research organizations and NGOs to support them in building climate awareness amongst their base and to plan their climate action. Uh, and research organizations and donors, they could provide the resources, they could provide documentation on climate impacts, they could provide technical expertise to help workers influence policies at multiple levels and access funds for adaptation and to help them engage in adaptation uh, committees and forums so that uh, plans for comprehensive climate action is done with and not only for them and i'll leave it at that thank you thanks so much everybody so we've got a couple of questions in the chat um and i'm just gonna i'm gonna just gonna give them to you and you can and you can decide who wants to pick one wants to pick which one um i might actually start with the second question because it, it i think it, it's, it's quite a good lead in so the, this is a question from justin first of all he thanks you for a great session uh and uh, he says i work largely with corporate players so i'm curious about examples they could be good or bad of how uh, they might do or um what they could do or what they might do to alleviate and uh, in, amplify informal voices for more adapted and resilient urban development so i guess yeah the role of kind of more corporate players the private sector do any examples come to mind? 
And then there's a second question, just as you're mulling this over, and this is, I think this is about sort of South North learning specifically. So are there any lessons that we could learn from communities in the global South regarding sustainable urban practices and um, how we might implement them in higher income countries? So, for example, there's been a lot of chat around 15 minute cities. I don't know how much this is translated to the global South, but what lessons are there from the global South that could be relevant to efforts to make um, cities in the global North more sustainable? Um, would anyone like to tackle either of those questions? <laughs> I can go for question two. Go for it. Um, so I think one thing that um, sort of uh, really helps in establishing more adapted and resilient uh, urban development and to amplify informal voices is to sort of be critical of what informal voices mean and who um, is allowed to the table within informal settlements or informalized settlements. So um, a lot of the time you will have, uh, for example, in the water sector, you will have um, associations or uh, interest groups that put forward those who are um, already in a place of uh, sort of more decision making capacity um, within these sort of low income neighborhoods, which typically tend to uh, exclude women and include men who uh, come from specific families or specific ethnicities. And so I think one thing to have a more uh, sort of inclusive way to include uh, uh, informal communities is to sort of be very aware of that and maybe work with um, uh, private companies, other private companies or um, civil society uh, groups that work within uh, these settlements. And one example I can give from Lagos, for example, is um, Arctic Infrastructure, um, an urban planning uh, company that is sort of collaborating and a private uh, urban planning company um, that is collaborating with the state of Lagos, but also with um, traditional medicine practitioners in uh, uh, one of the lowest income settlements in, in Lagos and one of the biggest ones, which is called Makuko. And so they collaborate with the um, healthcare providers to formalize their education and thereby sort of um, give them the opportunity to uh, become more legitimate. It, it's not necessarily a, a climate um, uh, sort of example, but I think there are learnings from there that, that you can take. And so they collaborate with the government government and, and sort of um, function as the bridge between the two. And one of the, the most important features um, as to why it's such a successful project in a place where a lot of projects fail is that um, the people who work in the company, they really have very good uh, trust relations with, um, with the community or with um, people in the neighborhood and with various actors. So they're accepted across different uh, groups and, and perhaps groups that have sort of um, tensions between them uh, as well. Thanks, Nura. Sonia, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, just to explore a bit more an example I briefly touched, which speaks to the question Justin has uh, made. Uh, so uh, we have been collaborating, WIGU, and the city of Belo Horizonte, the municipal secretariat for environment, and with the help of ICLE South America, we are preparing uh, climate vulnerability maps, uh, situating the sorting centers we have in our city where cooperatives of waste pickers work. Uh, we are situating the sorting centers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the information that the city has in its uh, database around climate vulnerability. And this is an important uh, tool because this will enable us to go back to the cooperatives and together with our partners do a deep discussion about not only what the city can do, but also other actors in the city can do together with workers uh, on how to prepare, you know, for climate uh, impacts. So this is just one example uh, coming from the South. Thanks, Sonia. Michael? I just want to, to add something to question one um, about what lessons can be learned from communities in the global south and high-income countries. And 
I'm sure there are lessons, but I also wanted to break down this binary between global north and global south a little bit. And that's something that we've done in uh, our, our article because we found that it's often not necessarily about global north versus global south, but often it's more about disadvantaged or low income neighborhoods uh, and parts of cities um, versus higher income or middle class neighborhoods and cities. And there, the challenges are often surprisingly similar. Um, for example, there's one paper um, done in Rotterdam in an urban lab with a high degree of, of uh, migrant um, inhabitants. And we compared the challenges that they had with their urban lab and the climate adaptation in this part of the city, in this neighborhood, with some of the challenges that we had in our uh, cities when we built up or tried to establish these urban labs. And they were surprisingly similar. So this link between... Uh, being vulnerable, being disadvantaged, and uh, having a certain perspective on and climate challenges, which is just one among many other priorities and problems, is something that is rather global across the world, I think. And so while it's, it's sometimes certainly useful to look at things from a global north, north global south perspective, I think this more general global perspective um, also often uh, makes sense. Thanks, Michael. Really, I think that might be a really nice comment to end on. Um, unless anyone's got anything else urgent that they'd like to share before we wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank our panellists and thank everyone for, partic for participating. Uh, it's been a really nice start to London Climate Action Week for us at IID. Um, I would just draw your attention to uh, the ongoing work of environment and urbanisation, which does focus on platforming um, the work of practitioners and, and people working on um, poverty and climate change in the global south. Uh, there's lots of really exciting issues coming up and also the work of um, IID and partners, many of whom are here today, that's focused on climate action and um, uh, and promoting equity in cities. Um, we can share more resources in the chat just before we leave. I think we might be might, might be about to run through. There is a lot of there are a lot of resources in the chat. I'd say that. Um, but yeah, just thank you all for participating. And if you're interested in learning more, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Thank you so much. <laughs>